Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, dear friends, welcome and uh, may God bless you. Who would have thought that uh, after a long period of uh, normal worship service and normal worship services, we would be again uh, in a lockdown. But despite all this, despite our inability uh, to go to our churches, to worship and fellowship with each other, God's word, it's not locked. God's word, it's not chained. And today we're going to study that word, God's word, eternal truths. And uh, for today, I, uh, I have chosen something very interesting and important something that uh, I called the most beautiful sermon with the most disastrous or the worst results. But uh, before we do that, and before we see the relevance of these words in our lives, as it is our custom, let us bow our heads and uh, pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, protection, forgiveness of sins. Even though we cannot be in our churches, even though we are in a lockdown and cannot move freely the way we would like to, still we can always come confidently before your throne, telling you our problems, telling you our challenges, our secrets, and asking you for your help, for your mercy, and for your deliverance. Be with us today as we are about to study your word. Help us to understand it, and please help us to apply these eternal truths in our lives. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. There is one Jesus' miracle that was so powerful that was uh, probably his most extraordinary, his biggest, his greatest miracle because that's the only miracle that it's mentioned in all four Gospels. And that miracle is when Jesus Christ fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. The year when it happened was around 30. And uh, immediately after that, the, the magnitude, the power of that miracle was so big, enormous, that people were, were just speechless. And people were following Jesus. And Gospel according to John says that many people who were following him, many of his disciples, wanted to crown Jesus Christ King of the Jews. Of course, as we know, Jesus' ministry his purpose, the reason of his coming on this earth was not to hold any political position because he was not a politician. He was not a military leader. He was, he is a savior, the savior, our savior and redeemer and creator of everything. And the event that we are going to read today happened immediately and occurred immediately after that greatest miracle. And we read about that, and I mentioned before, in John chapter 6. Because John chapter 6 mentions that miracle when Jesus Christ fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And then we see hundreds and thousands of people around him, following him. 
I believe of all Jesus' sermons that we can find in the Bible, in, in all four Gospels, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I believe that his sermon in John chapter 6 is by far the most beautiful sermon he had ever uttered, he had ever preached. The problem is that most beautiful sermon by the best speaker of all time, the best preacher in the history of preaching had the most disastrous results ever. And what we are also going to see through his sermon we will notice four stages of people leaving God. Because when people decide to leave God, it rarely happens overnight. It usually goes in four stages. So in John chapter 6, we see that Jesus Christ performed the biggest by far the greatest miracle. Everybody was stunned, flabbergasted, astonished. Wow! They had never witnessed something like that. Thousands, 5,000 grown up adults, men, just men, plus women and children, hungry. And Jesus Christ feeds all of them with five bread and two fish. Amazing. Extraordinary. And then the Bible says in verse 34, John chapter 6, that a multitude of people that were following him, they said to him wholeheartedly and honestly, Lord, give us this bread always. Because those words came as a reaction to his miracle, but also to his words in uh, verses 32 and 33, where he said, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I find these words very powerful. And I guess everybody else found these words very powerful because their reaction there, their response to that was 100% positive. Verse 34, we read again in John chapter 6, O Lord, give us this bread always. They want to experience that. They want to have that. And when we look back, maybe even now in our lives, but I remember when I was younger and I was a medical student, um, and I started reading the Bible, I, I accepted Jesus Christ, and coming to church and reading the Bible, those moments were the most sacred, the most beautiful moments in my life. Even though it was war in Croatia back then, I'm talking about the year 1991, even though there was a lot of uncertainty, we didn't know what tomorrow will bring. I was so happy. I was so confident. I was so secure. Because I knew that God is looking after me. God is looking after all of us. And I didn't know how, I didn't know when, I didn't know in what way, but I knew that God will 
solve everything. But those moments of reading the Bible, that first love, that moments of coming to church and singing those beautiful hymns, listening to sermons, I felt I was in heaven. It was amazing. It was extraordinary. And that's the way these people felt. They felt the power of God. They felt the power of salvation. They were hungry. They were starving. They didn't know when they were going to eat. How? There was no food. Nobody had a response to their problems. It was impossible to even expect any normal solution. Impossible for man, yes, but not for God. And that miracle, oh, it blew them away. And they want, they want to experience that. They want to eat that bread always. And they know that Jesus Christ is talking about spiritual bread. They know, they, they, they are aware. As a result of their response, Jesus Christ delivers as I said before, at least according to me, his most beautiful sermon. And we read that from verse 35 in John chapter 6. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Jesus Christ is very clear. He doesn't leave any room for doubt. I am the bread of life. You say, give us this bread always. I am that bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me. That of all he has given me, I should lose anything, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Such deep words. Deep meaning. Honest and sincere thoughts. Jesus Christ, that opened himself up, is saying to them, I am the bread of life. If you come to me, I will never cast you out. I will never reject you. And this is the will of God. Whoever comes to me, that person shall have eternal life. Come to me. Such a beautiful sermon. Such beautiful words. What was their reaction? What was Jewish response? One would expect to that Upon hearing 
these words, these words with such a deep meaning, so honest, sincere, divine. Words from somebody who knew what was in people's hearts, who had the best approach always, One who was sinless. One would expect or assume, correctly assume, that the words of such person, in this case, in the only case, Jesus Christ, would be accepted. But what was their response? And this is, dear brothers and sisters and dear friends, now we're going to see step one. When people start drifting away, this is always the very first step. When people start leaving God, and when they eventually, eventually leave God, it always starts with this. Step number one. Verses 41 and 42. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that then that he says, I have come down from heaven? This is step one. And step one is what? It's doubt. When people, when an individual leaves God, it always starts with doubt. When you are in a church and somewhere and you have friends and, you know, they're so friends and allies and they're so attached to you. They so love you. They so respect you. They so support you. And whatever you do, whatever you say, it's good. And then comes the time, our moment, when it's like, you see there is a change and that change it, it, it's in their, their attitude you, you see their 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 eyes their demeanor has changed they started to doubt is this really true are you really what you say you are I mean is that really the case, what you are saying? It's always like that, always, everywhere. And your workplace, family. First sin in heaven that originated and started in Lucifer. It started as a doubt. Because Lucifer, who eventually became Satan, did not commit adultery, which is a sin number one in most Christian churches. We, we always say, let's face it, we say all sins are equal before God. Yet, we kind of grade those sins. Murder, let's, wow. Somebody is envious, slender somebody, eh, not a big deal. Satan, Lucifer, doubted. These people doubted Jesus Christ. 
all of a sudden from total acceptance and recognition and acknowledgement, they were like, is, isn't this son of Joseph and Mary? I mean, we know him, we, we know his origin, we, we know his brothers, they're here amongst us, and how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Hmm, interesting. That's step number one. What's Jesus' reaction? Mind you, he has just fed 5,000 people. He's been there for a while, making miracles, raising people from the dead. So many, he has so many disciples. And now his own disciples started to doubt and question. They started to question some things they had never questioned before. Jesus Christ does not go into accusations. How can you be like that? Shame on you. I mean, seriously, I've been here with you. I mean, how can you be like that? He doesn't do that. Upon hearing that doubt, He goes even deeper in explaining who he is. What they can gain. Who? What's his true origin? Let's read from verse 43 in chapter 6, John. Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Wow. So deep words. So profound statements. Jesus Christ, he's opening himself up. To his disciples to the world. This is who I am. Look at me. Come to me. I am the bread of life. I am the living bread. If you eat of my flesh, you will live forever. Please come to me. To use... Um, the gambling poker term, he upped the ante. His sermon became much deeper. His statements more profound, more sincere. I'm talking about somebody who knew what was in their hearts. I'm talking about the creator of the world. He's the one who was preaching here. I 
Amazing sermon. And again, I will say, of all sermons that Jesus Christ ever said, at least those that we know of, that are written in four Gospels, this one is my favorite. And what was Jewish reaction? The reaction of so many of his disciples. Verse 52. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And this is step number two. So step number one of departure from God is doubt. It always comes first. Everything starts with simple, innocent doubt. It's not so innocent in the end, but at the beginning it seems like it's nothing. Doubt number one. Number two is discontent, the satisfaction. When we start doubting somebody for a long time, is this really true? Does this person really have my best intentions in his mind, in his heart? Hmm. If we live in that state of doubt for a longer time, that doubt turns and grows into discontent, dissatisfaction. Where we become unhappy with a person, with an institution, with leadership. This is not right. They don't want what's best for us. They're, nah, 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 this is, mm, mm, this is too much. We start arguing, we start gossiping, and that's what they started. The Bible says they started quarreling amongst each other. I mean, who is he? How can he say something like that? They chose, even though it's obvious, that when Jesus Christ says, if you don't eat my flesh, if you eat my flesh, you will have eternal life. It's obvious that it's, it has a special meaning. It's not literal. But they deliberately took it in a literal way. How can we eat his body? We're not cannibals. That's what they think. At this stage... When discontent, dissatisfaction takes over from doubt, we tend to distort someone else's words. Before, when we were happy with that person, whatever they said, we acknowledged it. We accepted it. If it was a serious thing, we were serious. We were accepting it. If it was a funny thing, a joke, we were laughing and we accepted it. Now, he's saying, she's saying something serious. We are laughing. Pfft. They're saying something funny. We're serious. We're distorting everything. In this case, they're distorting Jesus' words, intentions, thoughts. The best possible sermon, the most beautiful sermon of all time, distorted. Jesus Christ sees where this is going, where all this is heading. And he becomes even more serious, even more honest. He earnestly implores his disciples, please. Don't leave. 
We read wor words from verse 53 onwards. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink this blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And the synagogue in Capernaum was one of the largest in all of Israel. So he goes even deeper. He becomes even more sincere. He implores his people, please come to me, accept me. The most beautiful thoughts ever. What is their reaction? And we read their reaction in verse 60 of John chapter 6. Step number one, doubt. Step number two, discontent, dissatisfaction. And then comes step number three. Verse 60. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? And this is step number three. Their hearts and minds are pretty much set at this stage. They cannot be moved anymore. They have made their decision. And this is the stage, the third stage, the third step. It's rejection or rebellion, mutiny. Let's call it the whatever we want. At this stage, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible to please anyone. We have made up our, our mind. We have come to a conclusion, whether it's right or wrong, and we cannot be moved, we cannot be swayed, no matter what. We're just moving forward or backward. And this is what they had done. It's rejection. It's rebellion. They decided we're not going to listen to this anymore, period. It's over. It's finished. Jesus sees that. He knows it's finished. But it's like knowing that you are fighting a lost cause. He's still talking to them. It's so much love. From verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. And they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, 
Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And again, if if, if we read these words, this, this last statement, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. It appears as if Jesus Christ is talking here about predestination. That some people are just preordained to be saved and brought to God. That's not the case. King Saul was chosen by God, anointed by his prophet. He was chosen because he was good. He was humble. He had a stature. When he stood up, everybody was in awe. Wow! What a man! What a king we have! He was a good man. He was chosen by God. But we know what happened. And everything that happened to him in his life was his choice. A series of bad, poor, totally wrong choices. And eventually, he even committed suicide. King Saul. We're free to come to God always. We can always come to Him. He will never say no. And he will do everything in his power to keep us with him. To remind us how good he is, how much he loves us. But he will never make us do the right thing if we don't want to do that right thing. Also, he would never make us do the wrong thing if we do not want to do that wrong thing. Does this make sense? Whatever we do, bad or good, wrong or right, it's our choice. Jesus Christ knows that. He's still calling them, please. And then comes step number four, which is a logical step. John chapter 6, verse 66. It's very easy to remember. 666. Six, six. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. John 6, verse 66. Departure. Apostasy. That final step. After doubt, after discontent, after rebellion, comes this departure. I'm leaving. It's finished. Nobody forced them to leave. It was their choice. What's even worse when we read here is many of his disciples, John says, left him on that day. Mind you, there were hundreds of people there. Hundreds of his disciples who followed him wholeheartedly and happily. But from that point on, they said, nope, never again. This is it. The most beautiful sermon with the most disastrous results. How is that even possible? 
And that sermon came from the Savior of the world, from the creator of the world, from somebody who knew their hearts, who knew the best ways to convey the word of God and the message of God. If Jesus Christ lived today and he was employed by a church organization, any church, any denomination, after this, he would have been either reprimanded by church leadership or fired because the results of his sermon were terrible brother Jesus what is wrong with you why did you alienate so many friendly people people who pay tithe who help us to run this church this is not right where is your wisdom we, we would expect from a seasoned minister such as you to be wiser. Why do you have to say something like that? There are so many witnesses who said, you said this. I'm sorry, we have to part our ways. That's what would have happened to Jesus, most likely. Where are we now in this process? So this was Jesus Christ back then, his disciples back then. Where do we find ourselves? Are we on that first stage? Do we doubt? Are we at Stage number two, level number two, which is we're not happy, we argue, or probably three, flat out rejection, mutiny, rebellion. It is possible to come back. But if you want to come back, it would be good if we are in um, step one or two. Because once we find ourselves on step number three, it is very hard to go back. The most disastrous results, brothers and sisters. Uh, Every single time I read this story, this, this account, I'm shocked by the result. Deeply saddened. But even more so with Jesus' words. When he asked his, the 12, so hundreds of people left, disappeared. The Bible says many of his disciples were no longer his disciples after this. So all of a sudden from a full space, full synagogue, there's just 12 sitting empty, totally. And Jesus Christ turns to them. And we can hear sadness in his voice. Verse 67. Then Jesus said to the twelve. Do you also want to go away? And then Peter answers. And it was usually Peter. He was the oldest. But somehow 
his, his tongue was much faster than anyone else's. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. For me, this is the response of all responses that people can say, that all of us can say. Everything was great up until just recently. Everything seemed perfect. The movement of Jesus Christ was getting some steam. So many people following him. So many followers. He became number one. And all of a sudden, everybody's gone. Everything came crushing down. Sometimes we experience those same things or similar things in our lives. Everything is great at the beginning. Everything seems fine. And then all of a sudden, we experience loss, problems. We feel attacked. And one loss, another loss, then another loss, then another loss. There is a series of losses. It's terrible. It is a terrible feeling. We start questioning everything. We were praying to God. Praying for a miracle. But no, nothing is happening. What are we going to do? I have experienced so many losses. We'll experience some. With everything, some people ask me, especially after my brother died, after such a long battle and, you know, some other issues that happened. That deeply affected me, made a terrible, profound impact on my life. People asked, so many of them asked a very simple question, but it's a simple question, but it requires a very different answer. Did all that affect your relationship with God? My response to them is usually. What do you think? Of course that it affects everything. When you question, I wouldn't say the very existence of God, but sometimes there are questions like, does he care about me anymore? Yet again, what Peter said, that's what keeps me here, still keeps me hanging on. To whom shall we go? To whom will I go? Jesus Christ is the only one. God is the only one. What, what other option do I have? What other option do we have, all of us? God is the only option. Jesus Christ preached the best sermon, the most beautiful sermon ever, with the worst possible outcome. So many people left him. It also, I believe it also made an impact on, on the twelve. But they knew. And Peter summoned, summed up somehow, their own mutual sentiment, which was, to whom shall we go? Nobody said anything, but everybody was thinking that. To whom shall we go? 
you have eternal life. And that's my message to all of us today. When we experience troubles, when we are unhappy, when we start doubting, when we are uncertain about our future, when we don't know where everything is heading, let us ask ourselves. And, and you know, when, and, when Satan is very powerful in those moments, telling us and whispering us, it's useless, it's lost. Let us always ask ourselves this question. To whom shall we go? Whatever happens, let us always go to God. Let us always be with him. Let us always follow him. It's worth it. He's the one who has the words of eternal life. He is offering to each and every one of us eternal life. He is the bread of life. And let us eat that bread and drink of his blood. Because by doing that, by his grace and mercy, we will have eternal life and we will find ourselves in his eternal kingdom. Isn't that great? Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love, protection and mercy. And thank you for this message. It's not an easy message, but it's a message of hope. Like, even in the midst of uh, all rejection and loneliness, when we feel abandoned and alone and nothing makes any sense. And sometimes even we think and we doubt your love for us. Let us always be reminded of your love again. Peter asked a question. It was a rhetorical question. To whom shall we go? And I believe we all can ask ourselves and each other that same question. To whom shall we go, our dear God? You are the only one who can save us because you are our creator and you are our redeemer. Be with us always. Cleanse our hearts. Be with us. And we thank you for everything. In Jesus' holy name, amen. May God richly bless all of you. May his word, may his mercy and the power of Holy Spirit be with all of us. Amen. God bless.